Thank you. So tonight, our theme is celebration. We're going to celebrate a lot of things, but we're not going to do it alone from here. We want to get to know you. So before we start the program, we're going to come give you high fives. You guys, we're going to play a song. You guys want to dance? Give us high fives. We're going to be right among you. Okay. All right. Let's do it. Ready to begin? Uh, so tonight's theme, like I said, is celebration. We want to celebrate the life of Sonia Shaw. She's a very, very special girl, and uh, gives us gives me a great honor to just even be here. So we're gonna uh, celebrate that. We're gonna celebrate progress that Sonia Shaw Foundation made, right? So great. So the other thing is, it's not uh, that celebration. We're gonna celebrate ordinary people doing extraordinary things. So it's about Sonia, but it's about people like me and you, who are ordinary people, but we're, we're doing extraordinary things. How do we know that we're doing extraordinary things? We are. We're all here tonight, right? So first, give it up for all of you folks, and I'll tell you the reason. The reason is we're all changing uh, the world, one girl at a time, and that's Sonia Shah Organization's mantra. We are literally changing the lives of the girls in Pakistan. It's a great, great honor uh, to, to do that. Uh, and I think the biggest honor is to do it amongst you folks here. So the overview of the program, what we're going to do is um, we're going to talk about the heroic journey of Sonia Shah. And um, when I say heroic, I really mean it. And I'll tell you from my experience, Whatever I've been able to achieve in life, it's because of education. So I really get the value of education. The people that you meet while you're acquiring education, all of that is, is very, very important in life. So Sony understood that at a very young age. And um, we're going to hear a lot about her journey. Uh, and it's, it's really inspiring. I'm inspired uh, a little bit. Uh, so we're going to see the videos, we're going to hear about the progress made, and that's going to make you all really proud because you're part of the organization too today. Uh, then we have a keynote speaker. Uh, her name is Shadab Hussain, uh, who will take us to uh, KPK Pakistan uh, through the poetry. So I think that's going to be a fun part. You're going to get to familiarize with the area that Sonia Shah was helping at, and uh, just to bring things closer. And then we have Dr. Mug. She's a doctor and supporter of Sonia Shah organization who will play piano. And then we have two sisters, Jada and Caitlin. Uh, they'll play viola. And then last but not the least, we have some really good food and we have lots of fun games. So like we started the program, we want to keep this uh, evening interactive. We don't want to be the only two speaking and uh, we want your participation. So are you ready for the participation tonight? All right. I think we're going to rock the night, and uh, Ruby is going to help me rock the night. Yeah, for sure. So first, I want to give a little introduction to our DJ, Sayla Say, so if we can all give her a round of applause. She's going to be amazing tonight. Um, next, I wanted to share a little bit about how I became affiliated with this organization. It started in my seventh grade year when I showed a film called Girls Rising at my school to multiple grades, and then I did an after-school showing to my school and neighborhood community. And from that showing, I raised a, a certain amount of money that I was able to donate to this organization after hearing Iram on NPR. And she basically wrote my mom and I back, and I was invited to speak at last year's benefit at the MCA. And I shared with them my project and the amount of money I had raised. And since then, my mom and I both have become really strong supporters of this organization. We've helped plan this event. We've helped make decisions that impact the school in Pakistan. Another example is a couple months ago, I recorded some of Sonia's college application essays to basically make her come to life. And when I was reading them, it's so interesting because I thought to myself, when she was explaining the part about all her hopes and aspirations for 
the world and to see women become more valued in our society, I realized that so many people want to change the world and we all want to make an impact in such a positive way. But Sonia was able to articulate her aspirations so well. It, it made me cry. And since then, there's no doubt in my mind that Sonia is still with us here today and that she's a role model for all of us. So lastly, I want to say that I'm Ruby, but I'm also Sonia. Gibran is Gibran, but he's also Sonia. You're all you, but you're also Sonia. And that means that we all have the power to make an impact on this world, and we all have the power to make sure that women are more valued in our developing society. So thank you. Very well said, Ruby. Awesome. So, uh, like Ruby, I'm, I'm a very, very inspired member of Sonia Shaw organization as well. And I've, uh, I think one thing that I can say is that I've seen this organization from the start. I've, I was one of the lucky ones to see the journey. And we've had our ups, we've had our downs, but like they say, you know, no matter how many times you fall, what matters is how you get up and keep going. So that's what Sonia Shaw organization teaches me, how we've been able to rebound. And uh, look, we're celebrating tonight. So um, with that, I will uh, introduce uh, a very, very special guest. Uh, she is a board member uh, of the organization. So a little bit about her. Uh, she's a scientist. She's a lecturer. She's a philanthropist. She's got her master's in uh, management from London School of Economics. Uh, she's got two masters, uh, one in immun immunology and molecular genetics. She also has a PhD in hematology and oncology from Rush University. Um, so if you have a guest, I'll give you one more hint. She's the director of Urdu Institute of Chicago. Uh, and one thing that, in, that inspires uh, me about her is that she actually donates a lot of time to this organization. She basically goes to Pakistan. She takes a lot of guests. Uh, and when I say guests, a lot of into influential personalities in Pakistan. Because her school is in a very remote area. So you need all kinds of community support. Um, to run that school. So she's the one who goes um, and introduces uh, the guests in that uh, community. And that's, that's how we're able to run that school. And, and the best part about it is she does it on her own dime. So without further ado, let's introduce Dr. Syra Alvi. Thank you so much, Gibran. I don't think I deserve this kind of applaud, but it's nice to have it. <laughs> Before I begin, I would like to invite Zaheer to the stage. Zaheer is board member of Sonia Shah Organization. So there's a when I was thinking about this evening, I had recently seen this stanza being used, and I thought I'd complete it. Vajude zan se hai tasveere kainat me rang. Usi ke saaz se hai zindagi ka soze dar saaz. So, you know, that kind of summarizes the women and the struggle that we have here. Salaam, good evening to all of you. A girl, a dream, a mission, that's what Sonia Shah stands for. On behalf of Sonia Shah organization, members of the board, children and parents of the school, I would like to thank you for being here with us this evening. Zaheer, Greg Mortison, and myself, are on the board of directors. And we all come from different walks of life. But I should say this, that this school and this organization brought us together. We all believe educating, engaging, and empowering girls. Zaheer has an extensive bio on the website. I can't even begin to talk about his accomplishments. But briefly, Zaheer was born in Uganda. He uh, lived in Canada, studied in Canada, and is now in US. <clears throat> 
He is the director of ZL Advisory. He spent most of his professional career with the Abbott Laboratories, worked in more than 150 countries, and retired as a Vice President for International Marketing. Zaheer Lovji. The current board members are here to carry the vision of Sonia Shaw Organization forward. And through succeeding boards to ensure continuation of that vision, long after we are all, <clears throat> we are able to participate. The school started in 2014, has come a long way. We have over 150 students a vocational center, water filtration plant, and now this year, solar panels for energy and internet for connectivity. <clears throat> we believe the children of Kangra are growing up in rural Pakistan, but their young minds are supple and malleable as any young child anywhere else in the world. We firmly believe that with enough time, perhaps 10 to 12 years or more, that these individuals can evolve into individuals capable of fully engaging in the global economy. With this, I would like Zaheer to share his views. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome to uh, our annual uh, fundraising event. I greatly appreciate, on behalf of the board, I greatly appreciate your attendance, especially since there are so many other events that you would rather be at. But you chose to be at this event this evening. And so we are very grateful for your support uh, in this uh, endeavor. One might ask, how is it that I got involved uh, in this particular organization? To so give you a little bit of a framework, I was born in Uganda in a small village, not too dissimilar to where Sonia Shah school is in Pakistan. We had no running water, and we had an outhouse. So you can now imagine where I'm standing today, after having left Uganda as a refugee to Canada in 1972, and went through a number of years at university, uh, and did uh, some graduate work at multiple universities, and then joined the healthcare industry. Moved a couple of companies and then joined Abbott Labs, uh, which most of you know because I'm sure that uh, Abbott has impacted uh, your health in some way uh, along, the, along your life. And uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be given various opportunities and became a corporate officer, one of 50 uh, out of the 75,000 uh, employees of Abbott. And the point of all of that is that education, in my mind, is the single, single biggest economic equalizer. And not only is it an equalizer, if you look at educating women and educating girls, it is actually the mother who is the foundation of any given family. And if she has had the opportunity of education, She's going to ensure that her daughters and her sons are going to get educated no matter what, because that has changed their lives. Now, if you take the area, the tribal area in northern Pakistan where the school is, and all of you have heard from the media about all the problems and the Taliban and all the other issues that they face, and the fact that it is a challenging for women to actually get educated. And another example, of a squash player uh, who came out of that region as well uh, and became a professional squash player. And for the first 14 years of her life, she had to actually dress as a boy so that she was allowed to play squash. So when you think about all of these uh, different uh, elements that, and the challenges that they face in this part of the world, what we at Sonia Shah are trying to do is change that. And with your help, we can change that. Today, you also look at the progress that we have made 
from the beginning, humble beginnings. We've now got a structure that's a solid structure. We've uh, added vocational training. We're now in the next phase where we want to try to utilize current technology to impact the curriculum and the syllabus so that children in our school can get educated with the latest technology uh, that is available. So with that again, I want to thank you for your time that you've spent here with us and I hope that you will open up your pocketbooks and help us uh, achieve this dream that Sonia left for us to execute. Thank you again. And now it's my honor to introduce you to the person behind this mission, a dear friend of Zaheer and mine. There are not many people who can turn grief around into something so positive. I have the greatest respect for Iram for doing that. Iram is a truly a humanitarian, though she's a global ex corporate executive with a career that spans across multiple industries and countries. She's a senior vice president at Schneider Electric. She is also the president of the Sonia Shah organization. She served on several and continues to several other nonprofit organizations and boards, including Seeds of Peace, Central Asia Institute, Schneider Foundation, and Chicagoland Habitat for Humanity. She is definitely passionate about girls' education and women's empowerment and has been thought leader and keynote speaker at national and international women's forum. For the last probably three, four years, I get on this stage and there are two things common. My t-shirt, I always wear this t-shirt, and feeling of kind of loss and pain. At the same time, feeling good about the progress. But today, the feeling of joy and celebration is balancing the pain and sorrow and loss. And the reason is that we have made a lot of progress. Sonia's mission and vision is alive. Every year we did struggle, but as Gibran said, we got up and started again. And I'll take you through the progress. But today is really about celebration. Celebration of Sonia's life and her mission. Celebration of all those girls, 150 of those, in a small village thousands of miles away that you didn't even know you're changing their lives every day. Celebration of girls here, and a couple of them are here, who are getting educated because of Sonia Shah organization. So this is a celebration of all of us. And this is a train, the Sonia Shah train is moving on. And we get our friends on the train. Sometimes they go off the train for a little while. They go back up. Then we get some new people. And today, we have a lot of new people. So I welcome you. Maybe you know just a little bit about Sonia Shah organization. Some of you know a little bit more. Some of you have done some homework and read about it. So I welcome you because every person who comes on this train is adding value, is giving back to humanity, is empowering one girl somewhere in this world. Talking about new people, Ruby, earlier on the stage, she spoke so beautifully. She's only 14, just to let you know, some of you. Um, she started this journey with us last year. And today, it seems like she's been with us forever. And her mother, Monica, this would not have happened 
without her. Where is she? Monica, you gotta stand up, stand up. She has done everything here from the linen to the tables to the flowers. I couldn't have done without you. So thank you so much. And she, Ruby, and Imani sat down with me last night. And we bagged like 400, no, 160 cookies. And they are in front of you. Um, each one of you have two cookies. And, and the significance of those cookies is um, Sonia loved these cookies. And she and a very good friend of mine, Polly Galanos, they used to bake these cookies and um, raise funds for the school. So when Sonia passed away, Polly, who I know for the past 30 years, I know her before Sonia was born, she said to me, as long as I'm alive, I'm gonna make Sonia's cookies every year. Can you please get up? Give her applause. Come on. So thank you, Polly, I love you. I love everyone who has touched Sonia Shaw organization, even once. Um, and tonight is about celebration, but also I wanna make sure that you go away from this evening knowing the progress we have made. We have worked really, really hard. So I do wanna share with you the progress we have made, and I'm gonna use some um, slides for that, because to give you the progress, we have to go to the beginning of the journey, uh, which was started by Sonia. As you know, 17 year old, she decided to go back to where her roots were, a village, a small village in the northwest of Pakistan, quite primitive village, and I'll talk about it a little bit to give you kind of context. But she decided that she wanted to make a difference she was studying in an in international school in Switzerland. I was based there with my job. And she decided that she wanted to go back to that village, live there to understand the need of the girls there. And it shows in, in her college essay. I don't know if you guys can read it from there. I, I'll quickly read. It says, my heroes have always been the brilliant, flawed people who have acted, who have changed our history and made our world. Now I want to join them instead of only watching them. I want to serve and, and help others while pursuing my passions and interests. I want to leave this world knowing that I've changed it in some quantifiable, positive way, no matter how minuscule. I want to make history instead of just witnessing it. It is pretty awesome coming from 17. Uh, and I, I had not read this essay, it was shared with us after she passed away. And, and the college said to me is that we normally get a lot of um, big essays about people talking about themselves, saying they speak, you know, Sonia spoke five languages, she worked with a couple of congressmen. She never mentioned that in any of her college essays. The only thing she mentioned was that she wanted to make a difference, which was very impressive for this college. The other thing that she wanted to really impact because she wanted to make a difference is through girls' education. That was her route to make a difference in this world. My mother moved away from the village to come to the city of Peshawar, and I moved from the city of Peshawar to come to US. And she always felt that if my mother had not moved and I had not moved, she would be one of those girls. And, and she says that in her college essay again. She says, I've always been keenly aware 
that the efforts of my grandmother and mother are all that stood between me and the life of an underprivileged Pakistani girl. It is only through the work of the women that came before me that I don't live in ignorance and isolation. And every girl deserves the chance to create similar change for herself and for those around her. So this is the context around a 17-year-old girl who kind of um, forced me to take some of my retirement money. She was in the village, and she called me and said, and so Sonia was someone who never asked for a lot. She loved music and books, and I would punish her by taking the books away because that was the only way she would listen. So, and, so when she asked me for $20,000, I said, are you kidding me? And she said, I need 20,000 because there's a land in the middle of the village that is for sale, and I want to buy that because I have interviewed parents, and part of the reason why they don't want their daughters to go to school is they don't want their daughters to go out of the village, and they want to go to the nearby school, and I want to buy that land. And interestingly, I ended up doing that. I don't know why, everybody thought I was crazy, but we did it. So I, I want to stop here, show you a film, because there's a lot of new people in the audience, and I want them, I want you to really understand the context of that village by seeing the film, and then I'll take you through the progress. I know I have only another 10 minutes, but um, bear with me. In the world of every little girl, there is an innocence of joy, simplicity of play, and the bright colors of dreams. Our daughters everywhere are just the same. belonged to Kangra, a small village in Hyber Pakhtunkhwa, Pakistan. Her ancestors left many years ago to give their children, particularly their daughters, a better life. A life with good education and equal opportunities. A wish that still remains unfulfilled for the people of this village after all these years. In Kangra, only three out of ten girls attend primary schools where the quality of education is dismal. No girl has access to secondary education or beyond. In the midst of poverty, ignorance, and limited education opportunities for girls, Kangra remains a place where women continue to live inferior lives. Sonia, who was living a life with opportunities wished the same for all underprivileged girls around the world. Her wish to educate 
and empower girls became a mission. A mission that had to begin with Kangra. With this resolve, she returned to her village and Sonia Shaw organization came into being. The first project under the organization was to establish a school for girls with a strong curriculum and trained teachers. This would be the first high school for girls in Kangra. Just when her dream was about to take off, a tragic car accident took Sonia away from us. But her mission continues. In a village where there is hope for every daughter to have an enlightened present and a promising future, every girl is Sonia. Sonia wanted a better life for all the underserved girls of the world. For Sonia Shaw Organization, this school is just the first step. Our journey is long and full of hope. Changing the world, one village at a time. Changing the world, one girl at a time. So what I'll do now is to give you some progress on the school um, so that you, re you realize wh where we are today and the journey we have uh, been on. We have made a lot of progress and that's why today is a celebration. But before I do that, I want to give you some context because some of you know the northwest of Pakistan quite well. 
Some of you have heard about it, and others have, have no idea. Um, maybe in recent years, you have heard more about it in, in terms of extremism. Uh, but northwest of Pakistan is on the northwest of Pakistan. And it is um, now called Pakhtunkhwa. And Pakhtunkhwa means it's a race. It's not um, a place in Pakistan. It's a race. Pakhtun race is a very proud race, historical, historically. And they consider themselves to be blue-blooded blooded, people who have never been conquered. British could not conquer them. And it's also next to the tribal area. So very uh, strong culture and where they really, the tradition, are very, very important. In Pakhtunkhwa, there's a city, Peshawar, which is very modern, and girls go to school. But the Kangra village, where we are building the school, is quite further from that. So if you can see those two circles, this is Peshawar, and this is Charsada, which is a city, not a city, but it's a, it's a village, but Kangra is even further than that. So you have to go really towards the border of Afghanistan. And, and this is a place uh, which is about 45 or 50 miles from where Malala was shot. So Swat, you must have heard those you know, names and, and places in the news. So Malala was shot by Taliban. So it's a very primitive place um, in a country that overall is, is really developing uh, still. So now to give you just a historical uh, background on the school, and you saw that in the movie as well, that it started somewhere in 2013. Um, Sonia passed away in 2012, and um, we had to do something, and there are people in the audience who really gave me the courage to say, you gotta do it now or never. So I had to pick up the pieces, in 2013, we started the construction of the school because in her life, we had done halfway, we had bought the land, we had uh, done the walls, but the real construction started, the main school of it started after she passed away. In 2014, we had the inauguration of the school, and in December of 2014, the school was bombed by Taliban's and we lost uh, part of the building. No, there was no fatalities, which is very fortunate, but we did lose part of the school, and then we rebuilt it again. Just to show you how it looks now, um, this building is now one of the best buildings in, um, in the village. Um, it has concrete road in front of it, and really, all the extremism has disappeared because the villagers are realizing that we are doing all this for their benefit. So they are almost becoming guardian uh, of the school. The one thing that um, Saira and uh, he touched on, which was an uh, amazing change for our school, was the solar panels. We've been planning to do that until uh, this year, early this year. We were, plan we were able to install the panels, and it really ch changed everything for the school, because this is a village, imagine in summer, this village gets only four hours of electricity in a day uh, when the temperature is over 100 Fahrenheit. So this, uh, the solar panels really helped us to provide electricity to the school throughout the year, and also now we are able to run the computers, the fans, so this is becoming a place uh, like a village center. This is the only place that is lit up in the village if you go at night. And children come and play and they study by the lights. We have street lights. There are no street lights in this village. There are no roads. There are no road names. They're just streets, um, backyards. And this has become uh, Sonia Shah Road by default because the school is there. The other thing we did, which was um, destroyed in the first attack, and there are some donors here who helped us do that, is a vo water filtration plant, which you know, gave clean drinking water to the villagers. And once we had the solar panels, now we can provide water throughout the day. Because when the electricity would go down, 
the machine would not work, the filtration would not work. But now, because of the solar panels, we are able to give clean drinking water to the villagers uh, throughout the summer and throughout you know, the day. And in summer, what we did was we connected the filtration plant with the coolers, water coolers. So they got cold water throughout the month of Ramadan and also throughout summer. One other thing that we did, which is very important, and most of the schools, um, I have not seen any school who gives uniform to their students in Pakistan. We took the step to say, we have to give uniform to these children because most of these children don't have a decent pair of clothes. They used to come to school without shoes. So when we gave them the uniform, you cannot imagine the happiness on their face. They could not stop smiling because it was more than uniform. It gave them the identity that they didn't have before. And they, our registration went up from, uh, I think we were at 70, now we are at 130 because the students were so excited to have clothes, the shoes, the belt uh, that they come in. And I wanted to show you some pictures before and after, um, which some, sometimes they're not even recognizable. Look at the second picture. I mean, I couldn't believe that this is the boy who was before and after. And they're feeling also very different than where they were before. The uh, one thing that we promised you all, because once every year I come on the stage and my board members, we have a mental note of list of things that we promised you. And then the first half of the year, we are working towards that. So last year we said solar panels, medical clinic and uniforms. We did say lunch, which we couldn't do it. But after uniform was a medical clinic because these kids hardly go to the doctors. They do get vaccinated by the government, but they don't have a regular doctor to go to. So now, we, this year, last year, we had a medical clinic for our students. Now we have health card for each of the students to just monitor their growth. And we also um, found out some children who were quite sick. The others were just malnourished. We have vitamins that we gave them in school. We don't let them take home because we're not sure how they're going to take the vitamins or who will take it instead of them. And sometimes they will, might give it to the boys, but not to the girls. Uh, so we want to make sure that in the school, after assembly in the morning, that the teachers give them the, the vitamins before they start the school. Oh, sorry, I'm a little quick. Um, the vocational center was something that was important to the villagers from the day one because they all want to be economically self-sufficient uh, and they want to support themselves. And there are a lot of talented women in the village, but they had no place to go and get training. So we started our vocational center a couple of years ago and the first day we started, there were 40 women standing at the door because they wanted to come and learn. And now we have over 100 women who have been trained through our vocational center, and they are selling the clothes they are making, embroidery, crochet, uh, other you know, skills that they have. And when I went there last year, they were so excited, and they were telling me the prices that they were selling those clothes. And they were very honest. They would say, I make this for only 200, and I sell it for 1500. So I'm willing to give you some money to train me more. And now what we are thinking is that how can we bring their work, which is beautiful. I mean, it's the work that all of us can wear and carry on our bags. So our plan is that how we can take their work and sell it online. Because that village is so poor that there are, there's no market, there's not enough market for the skill and talent these women have. So we're thinking about how can we make this happen for them so that to elevate not just women, but the entire village with them. Last but not least, uh, Sonia Dream was not just for those girls. She started there because she said that if she didn't go there, no one will. So she did that. 
But she wanted all the girls in US, any country, to be empowered and educated. So we promised you in 2015 that we're gonna start a scholarship program for girls here in US, regardless of their background, ethnicity, who really deserve to go to college, but they cannot afford to go to college for a number of reasons. And we started this program, and our first recipient will be graduating uh, next year. And, and thank you, Zafar Bhai, for doing that. Since we don't have employees, um, full-time employees, I'm always looking to our friends who, are, who have the specific talent to help me. And Zafar, please, can you stand up? I just want to give you a round of applause, too. Um, he is um, a friend who I'll never forget after my daughter passed. And I have repeated this story so many times, and I'll keep repeating until it feels boring to me, and I'll do it until it doesn't. Um, he said to me, there's something special here, Aram. I know you're suffering, but I can feel it. There's something special, and you got to keep Sonia's mission alive, because there are not too many 17-year-olds who would start something. Parents do it for their children, but children don't start something. And since then, Zephyr Malik has been on this train. He's one of those, you know, as I said, some come and some go and some stay. And he's those who just stayed all the time, sometimes active, sometimes listening. And he is the one who helps me with really evaluating the girls. Because when we get, um, you know, uh, people requesting for scholarship, the candidates for scholarship, he is the one because he knows He's an educator, he understands it. So he interviews them, he does all the criteria, he has set it up, and every girl goes through his process to be eligible for the scholarship. Um, we had one girl already going who is here. Um, is Angela here? She's, I think she's volunteering somewhere downstairs. Um, but she is the newest um, comer in this process. And uh, I'm really excited for this because these are the girls I, you can see, I can see, I know their stories, and it's very, very powerful to really empower them and, and enable them to change their lives, their family lives, and their communities' lives. Last but not least, uh, I just want to thank you all. All of you are so important. Each and every one who has come here has given your time and slice of your heart. And I hope that that slice of heart keeps Sonia there, even when you leave. Um, so thank you very much. I do have some shout outs. So you probably uh, saw Sonia's essay, a little bit of it, and she mentioned her grandmother. And her grandmother is sitting amongst us, so I wanna give her a huge round of applause to Auntie Kulthum. And if you know her, she's just like an angel, and you have to meet her before you leave. Uh, one more big shout out. You saw Iram sp uh, speak and talk about Sonia Shah organization. Um, Sonia Shah's dad, Mr. Shah is amongst us, and, and he's been a great, great support for Aram, uh, enabling her to do everything that she has done for the organization. So M Shah, I know he's still standing, he's not even sitting, you probably see him taking care of the babies. So Shah, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Shah, the father of Sonia Shah. And one thing I just realized, uh, as I'm looking, uh, every seat when I was back there, people were looking for seats. So we have a sold out event. So give yourself an applause, because we have a really, 
sold out event. And then, you know, one thing I want to mention, this, guy, this gives a great testament to, uh, it, it, to the goodwill of Sony Asia organization that, you know, on a short notice, we have a full house here. So thank you very much for being here. All right, so let's play uh, some Jeopardy. So Ruby is gonna ask, give you a hint of a personality and you have to guess who that is. Okay, so this one's kind of an easy one, but she's a really good female role model that we all know. So she was the first deaf and blind person to earn a college degree where she graduated at Radcliffe College with honors. Does anyone know who this is? All right, I see a hand there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Helen Keller, yeah. All right. Great work. All right, so the second one. By daring to go to school, ladies and gentlemen, round of applause. All right, we'll do one last one and for this session. And then one more. So this person was portrayed in a recent film called Hidden Figures. She was the first African-American physicist and mathematician who worked with NASA. Does anyone know her? Come on up. Yeah, Katherine Johnson. All right, stand up. Great answer. Okay, so uh, the next guest I'm going to invite, uh, very, very special guest. Um, so just to kind of introduce you, uh, in introduce um, this guest. Like Aram Shah, um, he's an MBA for, uh, of finance uh, from uh, University of Chicago. He's a longtime activist in the Pakistani American community. Uh, he's an interfaith presenter and he writes about identity, bridge building and international relations. And let's welcome Mr. Rizwan Kader. Good evening. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Satsari kal. Namaste and assalamu alaikum, everyone. It's a great honor for me to introduce a prolific writer and an accomplished poet, our keynote speaker tonight. Shadab Ziz Hashmi to the Sonia Shah family of friends and supporters. Shadab's first book of poems, Baker of Tarifa, traces the history of interfaith collaboration featuring historical and imaginary figures. Il Andalus, the Muslim Spain, a 750 year era when the three monotheistic faiths created an exemplary civilization. The book won the 2011. San Diego Book Award for Poetry. She grew up in the historic city of Peshawar, and I'm talking quite a bit about it, in the KPK province of Pakistan, uh, not far from Kangra, where the Sonia Shah School is located. Shadab's second book of poems, Cole and Chalk, delves into the identity issues as she exhibits a deeper appreciation of Peshawar's vast global history. Coupled with her own experiences and observations in the aftermath of the war in Afghanistan and the post 9-11 conflicts. It is in that post 9-11 conflict era that uh, the challenging time when she and her husband raised a family in San Diego, a place that she calls home now in her adopted country. Tonight, tonight when she reads from Passing Through Peshawar, you will notice her nostalgia about the mythical place. Similarly, the border poems in her second book, Cole and Chalk, reflect the emerging realities of geopolitical tensions. She will also read for us tonight, Ghazal for the girl in the photo. The girl being a young Afghan woman, the photo being the most famous cover of National Geographic magazine ever. Shada will also read for us tonight from uh, her, um, we enjoyed the music. We really enjoyed. The mu music that was played entertained people from three different generations, at least for the last three decades. But when she reads poetry, we need a little bit of your attention because this is, these are complex issues and the poetry is intense. So we would like to, to indulge your, in, uh, your attention at the time. Shadab is a great expositor of 
the ghazal genre in the English language. She's a prolific writer for Three Quarks Daily, an internationally acclaimed online magazine for intellectuals. She will read her article titled, Ghost of a Frontier Town. She sometimes uses her middle name, Zis, as a pseudonym for her poems. It's a Farsi and Urdu word. It means life and connotates celebration. How apt for our theme tonight of celebration and life. So in a few words, you got a glimpse of Peshawar's place in history, Shadab's poetic tributes to it, but the point of it all is how a young girl from Deerfield, Illinois, started a school for girls in a village near Peshawar. An organizational point, Shadab, as some of you noticed, also did book signing at the beginning of the event. She will continue to do book signing towards the end, and all proceeds, 100% of the proceeds from the sales of the books will go to the Sonia Shah organization. Now, a little personal note about Sonia. I had the great pleasure of knowing this brilliant young woman who knew her role in a very complex world. She had a cosmopolitan upbringing, but also a strong sense of her roots. Then I learned of the unimaginable tragedy. Cried like a baby. A life cut short of its immense potential. The onus of the fulfillment of that potential is on us. And let's not make any mistake, that is our great honor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shadab Ziz Tashmi. And very proud of Sonia, Sonia's vision, Sonia's work, and also very proud of Iram's work. And I had a delightful chat with Sonia's grandmother. So, um, there's so much energy and inspiration in this room. I'm also very proud of each of you. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and uh, participating in this celebration. <clears throat> in history, as is the British Raj's moment of inebriation with power. Not far from Peshawar's military areas are two unforgettable libraries. These are the libraries I remember as a child going to these libraries. The British Council with its air-conditioned, brusque smell and the soothing secret of a raised reading nook. An ant chamber with round cane stools for children. And the Peshawar Club Library where there sits on the shelf a shadow book for every book. Every footfall and turning of the page is heard by ardent colonial ghosts. In the other environment, environs of this ancient city, the ruins, stupas, temples, orchards, caravanserais, graveyards, havelis, universities, and forts, there are ghosts of other inhabitants, invading Persians, Greeks, Marathas, Mughals, Sikhs. Peshawar has been the heart of the Gandhara civilization, beloved lotus land for Kushan kings. People Mandi, known for the people Bodhi tree under which Buddha is said to have preached. Very few people know this ancient and very important uh, history of Peshawar. The city receives its formal name from the Mughal Emperor Akbar in the 16th century. Peshawar means the one that comes before, in other words, the frontier. The first Mughal Babur Mughal ruler Babur's remarks upon entering the subcontinent through here are not flattering. It is dull compared to his verdant home Fergana in southern Central Asia. The Mughal emperors fill it with gardens, dubbing Peshawar the city of flowers, and leave, among other treasures, a beautiful 17th century mosque. Legend has it that Khizr, the green-robed saint, who appears to people who are lost in trying to find their way, comes to this Mughal mosque to pray. The mosque, Masjid Mahabad Khan, is bathed in elegant carnelian and ivory colors and surrounded by shop fronts of goldsmiths and jewelers who claim that this sacred place is befitting for their trade of precious goods. The faithful have been called to prayer five times a day for hundreds of years here. 
There is an ancient highway built by the Afghan Emperor Sher Shah Suri, extending from Kabul to Delhi, an engineering feat of the 16th century, renovated and renamed the Grand Trunk Road by the British. A multitude of cultures jostle each other along this road from Afghanistan through Pakistan and India. Muslim, Sikh, Christian, Hindu, Parsi, Buddhist, and others. In Peshawar, part of this road is still named Jamrod, and a footbridge over it is a thoroughfare for students walking to and from a complex of colleges in the area. If you're from Peshawar, you know this place really well. Part of it is tree-lined, part arid, the Safed Co Mountains visible in the distance. The city smells of bus fumes and is heartbreakingly resplendent in springtime. There are richly fragrant apricots and melons. The elderly men and women are thought precious and give and receive a kind of reverence that sweetens the air. The Sikh fort, Mughal marketplace, British clock tower, modern hotels and shopping plazas, cinemas, stadiums are astir with life. Since the time of the Soviet war, I have seen these places in the aftermath of bomb blasts. I have seen the insult of human flesh exploding into lifeless ribbons hanging from lampposts. I have heard children and birds shrieking in panic. In the register of shattering glass lives protolithic time, chipping away, accruing. Nothing goes unrecorded. With each passerby, the saffron curtain exhales, hanging over the threshold, the frontier. And I'm going to read two poems <clears throat> from my book, Coal and Chalk. Oh, actually, I'm going to read a poem, um, a ghazal, and it's a new ghazal, as Rizwan said. Um, I write the ghazal in English. There's a tradition in the US of uh, writing the ghazal in English, and it's, it's actually been, um, it's a tradition that's been going on for 60 years or so, so more than half a century. This ghazal is called Ghazal for the Girl in the Photo, and as Rizwan said, this is addressed to Sherbat Gula, the little girl, um, and everybody knows this uh, face, uh, it's, it's, it became iconic. It's an iconic face of, of suffering through war and displacement. And when I was growing up in Peshawar, this little girl, Sherbat Gula, um, was growing up in a refugee camp, not far from where I lived. I'm going to read this ghazal in the traditional ghazal style, so you'll hear some repetition, and you'll also hear a refrain. And the refrain in this ghazal is stranger. If you know Urdu and the tradition of the ghazal, you may chime in when I say the radi for the refrain, which is stranger. You became the girl with the piercing eyes when you found your country swiped by a stranger. You became the girl with the piercing eyes when you found your country swiped by a stranger. In Kabul snow, a missile turned your mother into coal. Your last tears were wiped by a stranger. A garden once hung from your name like the perfume of wild apple blossoms, phantom tulips. A garden once hung from your name like the perfume of wild apple blossoms, phantom tulips. In the refugee camp, are you sherbat gula, liquor of flowers, or a number typed by a stranger? Your eyes teach how cold flint ignites a flare, how a father's bones become an orphan's roof, your eyes teach 
How cold flint ignites a flare. How a father's bones become an orphan's roof. History writes itself clear as cornea, your green glare. No whitewashing, no hype is stranger. Pity the empire that failed to decipher the disdain in your eyes, the hard stare of war. Pity the empire that failed to decipher the disdain in your eyes, the hard stare of war. Pity the first world's pity, the promise of friends who show up as every type of stranger. And this is the signature couplet, again, as Rizwan explained, in the signature couplet, in a ghazal, the poet uses a nom de plume, or a pen name, and my pen name is Zist. Zist, return to the arms of memory, the riddle of its mind feels, velvet lullabies. And this is for all of us who are from Peshawar, and especially for you, Sonia's grandmother Kulsum. Zeest return to the arms of memory, the riddle of its mind feels velvet lullabies. To the lilt of this land, its lyrical storms, its bells and bagpipes, you're no stranger. Um, and I'm going to finish with a poem from Cole and Chalk. So, um, like most of my work, this poem, this poem is also about belonging to two places. Many of us belong to two or more places. We have multiple places to love and multiple kinds of people to, um, to serve. And uh, again, that's what we're here for tonight. This poem is called Notes for My Husband. I showed Yusuf to the amethyst morning when he was born. Kettle drums play four at a time, each tuned to play its own note. Each he would swallow whole with my vertical voice in Urdu and watch with his cardamom eyes the slow flare of Van Gogh's sunflowers, the silk ascent to Victoria's peak the concave shine of mango achar. He is slender like pine nuts and keen on butter. Yasin prefers honey and tells me the sun on the front door smells like library soap. I feel the light lathering the knob as I open it. The house is filled with jazz and bagpipes, Iqbal's poems on marble construction paper. We weep in both languages, and anything round is a planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are two things I want to say before I leave. One is that um, to convey my deep thanks to everyone involved with the Sonia Shah Foundation, I want to thank each one of the volunteers. And um, I'd like a big, um, big round of applause for the youngest volunteers. We have a 14-year-old. We have, we have all these young people who are bringing their energy into Sonia's dream. And last but not least, I urge you to donate generously. Generously, generously, generously. This is our world we want to change. These are our children we want to educate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so next up we're going to have two extremely young activists that um, incorporated the Sonia Shaw organization and some projects that they did independently come up on stage. Sure. So the first one, uh, very, very inspiring story. Um, so the sister, uh, Joanna, heard about Sonia Shaw organization 
And then she told her brother about the organization. So the brother got so inspired that uh, he made um, a poster for Sonia, uh, for Sonia Shah. And we're going to show that poster and bring on stage the sister, Joanna. And Gianni is the brother. Come on up. So first up is Joanna. I want to hear how she heard about Sonia Shah organization. And then we're going to turn over to Gianni. So, uh, hi, my name is Giovanna Ghiatti. I went to the, organ uh, the Sonia Shaw organization last year, and um, I was really excited about it. I really liked going, it was really fun. And that night, I told my brother all about it. Hi, my name is Gianni Ghiatti, and when she told me all about it, I was very inspired about all the things that Sonia Shaw did. The next day in religion class, I had to write about somebody who inspired me. I chose to write about Sonia Shaw because of I have three sisters, and it's I think it's very important for girls to get education. And if you can't see uh, uh, the writing, it says uh, so. So, so thank you very much. I think this is from Rory, uh, and we're going to introduce one more guest, uh, Rory. Um, is this from Giovanni? Okay, so Giovanni, do you want to read this for, uh, that's not yours? Okay, so we're going to introduce Rory, a little confusion, but nonetheless, a big round of applause for these young two. All right. Okay, so now we have a um, nine-year-old girl from Evanston in fourth grade who heard about the Sonia Shaw organization on WBEZ and felt really upset that girls weren't educated. And so Rory, can Rory come up on stage? I am. All right. So Rory went to her school and tried to raise money. She went through a few obstacles because of like just some things at school that they didn't want her to do her project. But I wanted to ask Rory a couple questions. So Rory, was it difficult to raise the money that you did? No, because it was for a good cause. And how much money did you raise? $200. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So Rory raised $200 at the age of nine years old after hearing about the Sonia Shaw organization. All right. So you guys must be wondering, you're probably smelling some good food here. Uh, I probably had some appetizers. Probably wondering when the food's starting. So let me give you a little preview. Uh, the food is just one act away. And this act is a very, very important part of this, uh, this evening. So this, uh, we're going to do some fundraising, but we're going to do it uh, very interactively, just like uh, we've done throughout this evening. Um, so rather than just asking you, like, hey, who wants to raise this much? Who wants to, we're going to go table by table, and we're going to try to make it fun. So before um, we go about fundraising, just uh, wanted to share a little note. Um, so I know Ruby introduced herself and she did an amazing job. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. Uh, my name is Gibran Elias. I was born and raised in Karachi. Uh, I came here when I was 14 years old. Uh, my high school and then w went to DePaul for undergrad and then Northwestern for masters. Uh, and I currently teach at Northwestern, uh, one of their digital forensics course. So you, when you hear about these uh, hacks, uh, the data, data breaches, uh, so that is what I do for a living. Um, so one, one, one thing that I want to say is that I was able to do this because of quality education. And one thing that me and my wife, who is also sitting in the audience, uh, Samra, uh, when we were coming here, we felt very elated. And we were just wondering, like, why we're feeling elated. So we just wonder, we're like, wh why is it that, you know, we go to so many parties, we go to so many events, why is this one more, most special? And... We, we had read just a couple of days ago that your life begins when you start giving and when you start helping people. So I want to start this fundraiser uh, with saying that, hey, we are the fortunate ones and we have the chance to empower these girls back in a town like Congra, which you saw in the most remote parts of the world. So. Uh, together, we can make a huge difference. We will all feel so good. When you go home tonight, you will feel very elated, just like uh, we were feeling. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, kind of introduce how we're going to do it. So we're going to go, we're going to have a little competition between me and Ruby. Uh, 
So are you ready for a little competition? <laughs> All right. So here's a competition. Ruby gets this side of the land. I get this side, all right? And we're gonna go table by table, and here's all we're asking. $150, you can, you, that is all, that, that's the cost of educating a girl for a year. Again, $150, that's how much it costs to educate um, a girl for the year. So we're gonna see if everybody that, who's here tonight can raise at least that much, all right? Fair enough? All right, so we're, Gonna start with uh, the first, or actually, we'll let Ruby, you start. Okay, so anyone on this side from any of these tables, can you raise $150 or pledge to give $150? Okay, here, and we have volunteers that are gonna go on around and collect right, the money. So the volunteers, um, so which table are you starting from? So raise your hand really high. Okay, so we're gonna go by, by this table. First, Rizwan's table. You wanna be the captain of the team, Rizwan? <laughs> All right in the next six months. So we want to see if he can have more hands on table 11 for 150 over the next six months. Okay, Rizwan is nodding. So, okay. All right, so we got three. All right, folks, round of applause for table number 11. Okay, so we're going to come here. Uh, I'll start with uh, table number four. How's that? So table number four, how many of you can give $150 tonight? All right, that's a, that's a full table, awesome. Round of applause. Excellent. All right, so table two and table one, I'll combine, because you guys are incomplete tables. So let's see if you can beat table four here. All right, so again, the question is, how many of you can give $150 tonight? All right, <laughs> that's awesome. We need some music here. There you go. All right. Actually, actually, she's listening to something on her headphones. But there you go. All right, so I'll turn it back to Ruby. So Ruby, okay, my guys. side is winning. Okay, so I'm losing that. right now. So can anyone else on this side give me $150 or pledge $150? Raise your hand super high. Okay. I think we're going by table by table. So I think we should start okay. here. Oh wait, this table here, can someone raise What's their the hand? number here? Do you have a table number? Oh wait, number nine. Table number nine. So can anyone from table number nine pledge or donate $150? Okay, three, four. Four. Okay. All right. Okay, so the ones who didn't raise the hands, can you pledge 150 over the next six months? So again, 150 educates a girl for a full year. I see some nods. Okay, so you have pledge cards also, so you can choose to decide whatever in the program. All right, so how many did we get from this table? Four, five? Okay, four. Okay, give it up for table number nine. Okay, raise the hand. Okay, so we're gonna go to this table. Let's see what's the table number here. Table number three. So table number three, how many of you can donate $150 today? <laughs> Look at that, the kids are raising their hands, awesome. All right, and for the rest who didn't raise the hand, $150 over the next six months? All right, we got a full house again. So table number three, give it up for table number three. Ruby, I'm sorry to tell you, I'm still winning here. Okay, um, what's that table's number? 13, can anyone from 13 pledge $150 or donate $150? Okay, four? Okay, we have four. Can anyone pledge $150 over the next six months? Okay. Okay. All right, we got almost a full house, right? How many? Seven total? Can, can we all raise the hands for pledging or donating? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, and... Six. All right, six it is. Table number 13, six there. Awesome. All right, so let's go to table number five, which is my favorite table. Ali, I'll nominate you to be the team captain since you uh, are looking pretty dashing. <laughs> All right, so table number five, uh, how many of you can donate 150 tonight? 
All right, we got a one, we got a two. And how many of you can pledge 150 over the next six months? All right, we got three more hands. That's awesome. And actually, I am sitting on that table, so I will pledge 150 myself. So table number five, we got eight. Awesome. All right, Ruby, over to you. Okay, table number 14, can anyone donate 150 or pledge 150? Three, okay, all of them, okay. How many? Table number 12, Viron, or which table? That was 13, 12, can anyone donate 150 or pledge 150 in the next six months? Okay, almost okay. a full house. Is that a full house? All right, table number 12, give it up, we got a full house. Okay, I will come back to this side. So we got table, we got this table. What's that table? Table number six. All right. This is beautiful. Folks, this, the view from the stage is amazing. This is for you, Sonia. This is definitely a moment to we'll all cherish. I will cherish this. This is amazing, guys. Thank you so much. All right, now we need the lights up so we can see who the, who the people are. All right, all the lights up. No, 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 not the phone lights, those lights. All right. All right, so have you guys seen a wave like in stadiums, in soccer stadiums? All right, so the kids know how to do it. So when the camera comes to you, just uh, raise your hands up in the air. All right, one, two, three, woo! Woo! All right, the wave is a little slow here, but it, it got there. Thank you so much. $36,000 right about, thank you all. Dinner? All right, uh, so we're gonna open dinner uh, in Iran.
you so much. It's a pleasure and honor to be here tonight. Uh, I want to thank Iran for inviting me to play. Uh, this mission is very dear to my heart, and I'm glad to be part of this wonderful evening and the wonderful crowd. Uh, the first piece that I played was from Beethoven to Relize. Beethoven has composed this piece in 1810, but it only got discovered in 1867, only 40 years after Beethoven passed away. So it was discovered by a musicologist, and actually it is dedicated to a mysterious woman whose identity to this date is still unknown. The second piece I want to play tonight is by Mozart. It's Mozart's Sonata in A minor, number 8. Mozart composed this piece in 1778. It was this summer. He was in Paris with his mom for a tour. And during this trip, Mozart's mom passed away from an unknown cause. So he composed this piece after he lost his mother. So unlike Mozart's most pieces that are composed in a major tone, which means a happy sound, this one uh, reflects his inner sadness and turmoil after he lost his mother, so it's in a minor tone. I'm going to perform the fast uh, movement, uh, the first movement. And then lastly, I will uh, perform um, Claude Debussy, Arabesque number one, uh, Debussy composed this about 100 years after Mozart composed the sonata, so in 1888. And it was, he composed this when he was in his early 20s, early on in his career. Debussy is a pioneer in Impressionism, uh, in music. So uh, imagine an Impressionist painting where we see the thick brush strokes and then the colors intermingled with one another and there is light reflecting on the objects of the image. So Debussy is creating the music as an impressionist composer. So when you listen to the music you're going to hear the movements of the arms and the fingers creating the colors of music so you have to think about colors and shapes. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. 
a volunteer selfie, guys. All right, and you guys are in the background. We can turn on the lights if you can, please. Okay, one, two, and there you go. Three. Sorry, I'm not the 
one of the lucky ones to see the journey. Um, we've had our ups, we've had our downs, but like they say, you know, no matter how many times we have a full house here. So thank you very much for being here. Alright, so let's play uh, some Jeopardy. So Ruby is going to ask, give you a hint or personality, and you'll have to guess who that is. Okay, so this one's kind of an easy one, but she's a really good female role model that we all know. So she was the first deaf and blind person to earn a college degree where she graduated at Radcliffe College with honors. Does anyone know who this is? Alright, are you seeing a hand there? Yeah. Good. Helen Keller, yeah. Alright. Alright, so the second one. By year to go to school as a young teen, she defied the Taliban and then violated the Taliban. And became a global icon. This is for you, Sonia.